Governors, we've heard a lot of media talk about President Trump's 100 days in office. And Governor Kane, how did that benchmark get started in the first place? I think it got started with Franklin Roosevelt when he was elected and we're in the middle of a depression and everybody expected him to do some actions right away because he said he would and he had to. And they didn't do much in the first 100 days. There's one or two bills, but that's about it. Uh, so even he didn't do a lot in the first 100 days. And I think as I think of president since, it's very hard to think of a president who accomplished much in 100 days. So it's not a, it's the press likes to fool around with it. Sometimes a, you have things that are almost ready to go at the end of 100 days, but it's hard to, to me to think of a president who's done a lot in that first 100 days. So what's its importance, Governor Whitman? There really isn't any. I mean, as far as public policy goes, it's more perception. This president has made it more of an issue because he made so much of the first 100 days all during the campaign. He kept saying, in my first 100 days, you know, this will turn the world around and, and I'm going to accomplish great things in the first 100 days. I mean, that's his problem, is that he's getting sort of hoisted on his own petard in the sense that he kept saying the 100, first 100 days are going to be important, but they're really, they're really not because you're getting your cabinet in place, you have a lot of appointments to make. I mean, yes, he got his Supreme Court nominee through, but at a really high price as far as relationships between Republicans and Democrats and the Congress go. With the majority in both houses of Congress, does that make the job harder or easier? Can you, what can you count on? It doesn't make it any easier, particularly with this majority, because uh, he's, and he's finding out the job is hard. This is the first president we've elected in my lifetime who's had neither government or political experience, neither one. So he's learning or trying to learn every day in the job. And it, it, it's hard, and he's finding out how hard it is. But the Congress, with the Republican caucus, You've got this Freedom Caucus where you've got a lot of nutty people there, and they um, are going to say no to almost everything. But then if you give them what they want, you get the moderates from states like New Jersey, and they're going to say no. So you're never going to get a majority. So you've got to go bargain with the Democrats, and Democrats are saying no bargains. We're not even going to talk to you on anything. So he's, he's in a tough position. The president has put forth a tax plan which calls for cuts for individuals and corporations. So how is this all going to play out, do you think? According to the Congressional Budget Office, this is still going to raise the deficit, and that's where you get into another fight between the Freedom Caucus and the others, the moderates in the, on the Republican side, because for so long everything's been about reducing the deficit. This tax proposal does not seem to focus on that at all, and so that's going to be a real constraint. Well, that is a dilemma, I would think, with the Freedom Caucus, uh, that side of the Republican Party, and certainly you wouldn't think the Democrats are going to cooperate with this. Well, you know, that's, in a sense, a national tragedy, that the two parties aren't talking anymore, because there are good things in this plan. I mean, the simplification of the tax code mm -hmm. to three brackets, that's be wonderful. The idea of cutting out a lot of these special interest uh, things that have gotten into the tax code by lobbyists for over, over the last 50 years, uh, things like getting rid of those kind of things and cleaning up the tax code and making it something where you and I can understand when we look at our tax bill, uh, that would be a wonderful reform. Governor Whitman's absolutely right. You can't, you can't just cut taxes, period. You've got to make sure you stimulate the economy so you get some of that money back. You've got to make sure you're not running up the deficit too highly. And um, he's going to run into a lot of Republican opposition if he does to run up that deficit without having counter other measures. Is the president a deal maker? What do you hear from your fellow Republicans? Is he good at that? Uh, political deal making is different than business deal making, and I think that's where he's finding the problems. Um, and international deal making is different than when you're trying to uh, negotiate for a hotel or something. And he's, he's running into problems with that. He does know how to do it, but you don't threaten um, in the same way when you're trying to get people so that you can work with them afterwards. Once you've done this deal, you still need to work with them. It's not one of those things where once you've gotten the deal done, you can walk away because the hotel will be built or whatever has happened is, is done. It's over with. It's not. It's an ongoing process. It is encouraging, I think. The one, one encouraging thing is I think he has come to some understanding with China, mm -hmm. it seems, in those conversations. Uh, the biggest effect is North Korea, but they've also talked about trade. And uh, if that continues, if we really have got a good relationship between the President of China and the President of the United States, that'll be good for the world. So, so that's, a, that's a very good thing. When he's Hopefully. changed, I think yeah. it's been good. Yes. The changes we've seen have been, have yeah. been good ones in sign yeah. of the maturing and, and understanding that it's not the way mm. the business world works. Yeah.
Well, governors, thank you very much for sharing your views. Thank Pleasure. you.